In this session, we come to the historical books of Joshua through Esther. And as you might imagine, in narrative story and in the historical section, there are not as many statements of doctrinal teaching. Instead, what we see is the storyline of the Old Testament carried out. But recorded in these stories are some interesting developments, and we see evidences of the doctrines of grace. Uh, they will be sometimes obscure, uh, sometimes standing in the shadows, but when we turn a spotlight on them, we will be able to see them and to understand God's sovereign grace over man's hearts and lives. And so in this session, I want us to look at Joshua through Esther and see the, the work of God's sovereign grace. So I want you to come to the book of Joshua, and I want you to come to just one verse. As you know, the book of Joshua is a remarkable uh, series of accounts and stories. But in Joshua chapter 11 and in verse 20, uh, we see the sovereignty of God on display over the hearts of unbelievers. And this is, this is remarkable, that God often uh, performs His greatest work uh, of display of sovereignty, at times not in believers, but in unbelievers. And so in Joshua chapter 11 and verse 20, uh, we read this, For it was of the Lord, meaning it rested with God. It came forth from God. God is the source. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, to meet Israel in battle. God hardened their hearts so that they would enter into battle. And the reason that they would, be, that they would enter into battle would be that they would be destroyed. So here we see the sovereignty of God even over unbelieving hearts to further harden them because their hearts were already hardened by sin and to cause hardened hearts to be hardened all the more in order to carry out the purposes of God. Would it not amaze us if we could pull back the veil today and see whose hearts God is hardening in government and in positions of leadership over nations in order that God would carry out His wise, eternal purpose and plan. Come with me now, if you would, to the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, we find more. We find more historical accounts and stories. And so there is very little doctrinal teaching per se, but what we see is in the, the midst of these stories, we see doctrinal truths. So in Judges chapter 2 and in verse 10, this really gives uh, uh, the spiritual background and, the, and the, the big picture, the macro picture for the nation Israel at this time following the leadership of Joshua, we read, all that generation, now that's a pretty large all-inclusive statement, all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, that means passed away and died, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord. You see, every generation starts out not knowing the Lord and must be brought to the place to know the Lord through witnessing and evangelism and the work of the gospel. But no one enters this world knowing God. Everyone enters this world not knowing God and must come to a time and a place in their life where they enter into a saving relationship by grace with God in which they now come to know God. But here we see the doctrine of total depravity and radical corruption, that as this new generation comes onto the scene, despite the spiritual heritage, despite the spiritual background, uh, despite having 
Joshua and other men, despite being in the promised land, despite being in the best of environment, despite being in the place where God had led the nation, they still didn't know God. It's possible to be in church and not know God. It's possible to be in a Christian family and not know God. It's possible to be in a Christian school and not know God. And that is why every heart must be circumcised and brought to a saving knowledge of God. But note the next verse, Judges 2, now verse 11. So what is the result of not knowing God? How, how do you act? How, how do you live if you do not know God? Verse 11, then the sons of Israel, consequently the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and serve the Baals. Every soul that does not know God, this is the fruit. This is the result. This is where it leads. Unbelief is the root and doing evil is the fruit. And so if you want to turn a nation around, you just can't legislate that everyone do what's right. There must be the gospel being preached. And there must be people brought to a saving knowledge of, of God. But even that requires the inscrutable purposes of God at work in a person's life. Verse 12, and they forsook the Lord. Of course they forsook the Lord. They were unconverted. They were uncircumcised of heart. They did not know God. Of course they forsook the Lord in the middle of verse 12, and they followed other gods. Of course they did. No one is in a, 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 a spiritual no man's land in the middle. I mean, you're either following God or you're following other gods, small g. Uh, but everyone is following either the one true living God or following gods of their own making. Verse 13, so they forsook the Lord. Again, of course they forsook the Lord. And serve uh, Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Of course it did. God is a holy God. And God takes no pleasure in evil and in wickedness. And the fury and the righteous anger of God was kindled and, and burned against Israel. And He gave them into the hands of, of plunderers who plundered them. What God did is God just gave them a push in the direction they were already going. You want to go that way? Here, I'll help you. And so God gave them into the hands of, of, ev of ev evil men and sold them into the hands of their enemies. Not only was God their only hope, God was their biggest threat. And it was the righteous judgment of God. This is Romans, 11, Romans 1 being lived out before their very eyes. So come to the end of the book of Judges. Come all the way to the end. Just fly through the book of Judges and come to chapter 21 and verse 25, the very last verse in the book of Judges. We've, we've kind of bookended this. We looked at the beginning, now look at the very end. And I want to tell you, and everything in between is just kind of second verse, same as the first, more of the same, with isolated instances of God raising up people to know Him. But when we come to the end of the book of Judges, here's total depravity for you. In those days, there was, not, there, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. There you've got total depravity. There you have man left to himself to go his own way, to do his own thing, to pursue his own sin, and everyone is a, really a god unto himself. Uh, everyone is setting his own morality. Everyone is setting his own standard. Everyone is going his own way. Everyone is making his own bed and lying in it. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Sound familiar? All right, let's come, if you will, now to the book of 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, um, we see 
in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and in verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. How would you like to have that on your epitaph? <laughs> There's a verse to put on your refrigerator right there. The sons of Eli were worthless men. Uh, and literally worthless here is sons of Belial, which was a name for Satan. And in essence, in code language, they were the possession not of God, but of the prince of this world and the God of this age, um, as all unbelievers are. And so they did not know God despite the fact that they grew up in a very spiritual home, despite the fact they had an exposure to spiritual truth, uh, despite the fact that they were raised in a spiritual environment, uh, they nevertheless remained uh, separated from God and did not know the Lord. There was no personal relationship with God. God. So we come to, and that again is spiritual depravity. So we come to chapter 3 and verse 7, and we read, Now Samuel did not know the Lord. Um, there had not been a time in his life when he was converted yet. There was not a time in his life he no doubt was circumcised physically. Um, he was a part of the nation of Israel, but he did not know God. And again, hell is full of people who have gone through the religious motions of the external trappings of an outward form of religiosity, but who do not know God and said, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. And the word of the Lord must be on the inside revealed to him. So as we continue uh, to look, um, back up a few verses in verse 4, uh, the Lord called Samuel... And he said, here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. But he said, I, I didn't, did not call uh, you down again. So he went and lay down. And then in verse 6, the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I, do, I did not call my son, lie down again. And it is then in the next verse that we read that he did not know the Lord. But in verse 8, and this is the persistent call of God. When God calls, he will not take no for an answer. And we may resist, we may stiff arm, uh, we may continue to run away, but the hound of heaven will be after his own chosen ones and will pursue us to the gates of hell, if need be, to save us and to rescue us. And so in verse 8, so the Lord called Samuel again for the third time. And God's calling so many times is a process that can be just a point in time. Think of Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> It was in a millisecond that the call and the conversion came. But with other people, it can be over an extended period of time until the Lord finally gets our attention and His calling is irrevocable. And that is what we see here. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. This call was a shout. Uh, this call was a summons. This call was a subpoena. Uh, this was the inevitable triumph, a sovereign grace in Samuel's life. 
And it was a call that arrested his heart and laid hold of him just like it did your heart in my life as well. Now, the circumstances would be different, but the reality is the same. It is the powerful call of God. And please note, he said, Samuel. It wasn't a whosoever will may come. That is the outward preaching of the gospel. That is the outward free offer of the gospel. We're to go into the highways and into the byways, and we are to call all men to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ indiscriminately. But our call will not save anyone. That's just the external call. There must be the internal call. And when God calls, He calls by name. God doesn't call whosoever will. Lazarus, come forth. Matthew, come follow me. Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I must dine with you tonight. John chapter 10 says He calls all of His sheep by name. That's how personal the call is. In fact, someone has said, when Jesus stood before Lazarus' grave, if He had only said, come forth, the entire graveyard would have emptied. <laughs> Lazarus, come forth. And He calls us one by one. He calls us individually. It's not a group. It's personal. It's individual. And that's why there must be a personal and an individual time in your life when the Lord called you by name. He called you out of darkness and called you out of this world and called you into a saving relationship with Himself. That is what is transpiring here and is what is taking place. Later in the book of Samuel, we read uh, further statements of displays of God's sovereignty in the, over the lives of people. And in 1 Samuel 16, uh, verses 14 through 16, we read, The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Satan didn't send that evil spirit. The Lord who is over Satan sent that evil spirit. And as Martin Luther has said, the devil is God's devil. Uh, the devil is a tool in the hand of Almighty God is a pawn in the hand of Almighty God to use according to God's eternal purposes. And it's the Lord who sent this evil spirit to, to Saul to, to traumatize him and to terrorize him. Later in 1 Samuel 18 and verse 10, we read, Now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from the Lord came mightily upon Saul. God is sovereign not only over the kingdom of light, but over the kingdom of darkness. God is sovereign not only over the seed of the woman, but though over the seed of the serpent as well. And in 1 Samuel 19 verse 9, we read again, Now there was an evil spirit from the Lord on Saul. And it was to harden Saul's heart. So we see the doctrines of grace, and a part of the doctrines of grace is even the doctrine of reprobation, that those who are passed over, God leaves them in their sin, and at times is very involved in the hardening of their heart. We come to 2 Samuel as the storyline continues uninterrupted from 1 Samuel to 2 Samuel to a time when David will assume the throne. And second, just a few verses, 2 Samuel 12, 11 and 12, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives... Uh, before your eyes and give them to your companion and he will lie with your wives, etc. And God says, I will do this thing. God is not the author of evil and God is not the author of sin, but God is the author of a plan that uses sin and uses evil for the furtherance of his own purposes and at times very mysterious to us. But even Judas himself had a place 
to play in the eternal purpose of God. And Jesus said it would have been better for him if he had never even been born as it relates to his eternal destiny. Nevertheless, within time, he was a bit player on the stage of history that God chose to use in a particular way. And the same can be said of Herod and Pilate and the other leaders that were a part of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. In one sense, it was the most awful day in human history as there was the premeditated murder of the Son of God upon the cross by godless men, and yet at the same time, it was according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. It was the most glorious day in human history. How strange that both those statements could intersect in one particular day. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And one other verse in 2 Samuel 24, verse 1, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel and it incited David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Uh, we know from reading First uh, Chronicles 21 that it was Satan who um, incited David to do this. And yet in this passage, it said God incited David to do that. How does that work? Well, God was working out His eternal purpose through secondary agent, through Satan, to be at work in David, yet God remained Lord over it all. Let's come to the book of Ezra, and very quickly in the book of Ezra, uh, we read in Ezra 1 verse 1, "...the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation. Listen, Cyrus, king of Persia, was a reprobate. He was an unbeliever. He he didn't know the Lord. Yet it was God who was controlling his heart. It was God who was stirring up his spirit to carry out the plan and the purpose that God had. And we read again in Ezra 6, verse 22, the Lord caused them to rejoice uh, and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria, that would be Artaxerxes, toward them, Again, he was an unbelieving king with an unbelieving heart. And it was the Lord who pivoted his heart and turned the unbeliever's heart into the direction that God wanted it to go so that it would have its effect in the storyline of history. And in Ezra 7, verse 27, again, we read that that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to adorn the house of the Lord. God sovereignly controlling the the heart of the unbelieving king Artaxerxes. Yet God planted it in the unbelieving king's heart to do what he did because God desired it to be so. How much more does God do the same in unbelievers' hearts to turn that heart to Himself, to believe upon His Son. God is free to invade human hearts to do what He so desires. There's no place in the universe off limits to the sovereign, omnipotent hand of God. Finally, in the book of Nehemiah, just very briefly, I have one verse for you. Again, it's a historical narrative And um, it's full of action. And there is this one snippet, Nehemiah 9, verse 7, you are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out from Ur of the Chaldees. Here, just in passing, really as if it's no big deal, as if, hey, this is Christianity 101. There's no further explanation needed. Uh, If you're a believer, surely you know this, that God chooses His own people and brings them out from where they were to where they are to be. Uh, This is elementary. This is kindergarten level, biblical truth. And so just in passing, without a need for further explanation, it presupposes how well known this truth was for the first readers who would pick up the book of Nehemiah and read it, it presupposes how well instructed they were already in the sovereign activity of God. 
Uh, only today was so much as J. Vernon McGee would call stinking thinking. Uh, do we need study Bibles with very long sections at the bottom to try to explain these doctrines that were just understood by the common person in this day and time? Well, may the Lord cause our hearts to rejoice that history is His story and that He is the God of history who intervenes and turns the hearts of men and women according to His sovereign pleasure.